the magnets that you need to build the kind of tokamak that tokamak energy is looking at need to carry a lot of current in a very small cross-sectional area. So the materials that we work with here, the, these HTS tapes, are the only really viable materials that you can use to do that. So what we're doing with these experiments today is a characterization of some high temperature superconducting tape to basically find out how much current it carries, what we call its critical current. To do that, what we're going to do is pass current through it and keep increasing the current we pass through it until we start to see the voltage of it rise from zero. So while the tape is uh, behaving like a superconductor, it will have zero, zero electrical resistance, so we'll measure no voltage across it. And as it stops becoming a superconductor, it transitions into the normal state. We push it outside of its superconducting regime and it will start to develop a voltage, so we'll see that voltage rise. And from the point at which it changes, we can find its critical current. But the critical current is important because it's basically the limit of the current we can put through it in a real practical application. As we push current through a wire, if we say the current is traveling out towards you, it will produce a magnetic field that goes around like this. So if we then coil that wire around into a solenoid, it's going to produce, every section is going to produce this, this loop of magnetic field, which ends up with a field in the outward direction and say the vertical direction too. When you wind lots of these together, like we do with the HTS tapes, that means you get a magnetic field not only on the plasma or the, the center where you want it, but also on the tapes themselves. And that's going to vary across your magnet. So it's important to know how much current you can carry each of these parts at different magnetic fields so you can accurately map how that magnet will perform. So what we've got here is the little setup we use. So we've got a short sample, it's about 12 centimeters long, strapped between two current leads, the positive current lead to push current in, it will flow across this silvery tape here, and then the negative current lead, which will pull the current out this side. What we do at the same time is with these two little bits of copper, they've got tiny little uh, pressure screws underneath, which act as voltage taps. So they, they are metal contacts to the tape, and we measure the voltage drop between these two points. So we can push the current through and measure what's happening across the tape. This test we're going to do now is only at, in liquid nitrogen at 77 Kelvin. One measurement will be in what we call the in, in the cell field of the tape, zero applied magnetic field. And the second one, we'll put the tape inside of a magnet. And so we can then see how the performance changes in the magnetic field too. So what we're doing first with this experiment is just filling it with liquid nitrogen. So we, we fill this can with liquid nitrogen which will then get raised up by one of the jacks and submerge the HTS sample that we want to measure. We'll give it a bit of time to thermalize and then the tape will be at 77 Kelvin for the first measurement. So the materials aren't a superconductor until you cool them down. At a certain point, they transition from being a normal metal or semi-metal, whatever, whatever they are, to, into the superconducting state. In the superconducting state, they are limited by the magnetic field you put on them and the amount of current you push through them. So now we've just got a full jar of liquid nitrogen. The sample is submerged. Um, I'm just giving it a couple of minutes to thermalize. So I'm just going to set up the software to do its thing, and then we can actually set it off running. So now the current on the power supply is increasing, and we're getting a voltage back. So as it starts going really steep, that's when the superconductor is leaving the superconducting state, and the current is transitioning out of that HTS layer into the silver and copper around it. Then the second one will raise the second jack up, then the tape will sit inside of a magnet, which is in the bottom of that cryostat, the bottom of the little dewer. And then we do a second measurement of the critical current inside, inside a magnetic field. And you'll be able to see from the difference in the measurements that when we put it in a magnetic field, the current it carries is lower. So in the superconducting state, the material will have no electrical resistance. So you'll see this nice flat, light, flat voltage as a function of current. And then as you start to hit its, its critical current, its critical surface, it will transition and the voltage will rise. It's done the first measurement and we've got this current voltage characteristic here. You can see it rising. The software does a fit and from this fit, we extract the critical current of the tape, which is shown here. It's about 950 amps for this, for this particular tape. I'm just setting up the instruments at the moment. So all I'm doing is I've set it off to do a sweep. It's going to wait for a few seconds and then it's going to turn the current on and sweep from zero amps until we quench the copper. So what we're doing is we're comparing the current voltage characteristic of the copper against that of the HTS tape. So I mean, we're nowhere near 
the current the tape took already, but the copper is linear as a function of current, so it's, its resistance is ohmic. So it's, it's already at a much higher voltage and resistance than the HTS tape was at 900 amps, and it's producing far more heat. And at some point soon, I imagine it will go pop. There we go. So that was it popping. So what we can see happen there is the, the power supply current dropped to zero and the voltage dropped back down to zero too because the tape burst. So it created an open circuit so we can't push current through it anymore. So it did that at around, around 500 amps, which is almost uh, half of what our superconducting tape took without any damage at all. The copper tape that we've tested here is actually, it's the same width as the HTS tape, but it's a little bit thicker. So it's got a higher cross-sectional area. As the cross-section area of the copper goes up, the amount of current I expect it to be able to carry will also go up. This copper not only has burnt out and underperformed compared to the HDS, there was more of it to take the current to. I would have expected it to perform better if it was the same material. The two different tests we've just done on the rig behind uh, have shown that the superconducting tape, the HTS tape, carried about 950 amps before it stopped being a superconductor. So up until that point, it had no electrical resistance and was wasting, dissipating no energy at all. We then did this, the same test on a piece of copper tape. The moment you put any current through it, you can see it's, it's ohmic, it's got uh, resistance, and it carried less than half the current that the HTS tape carried before it not only stopped working, but actually blew up. So the HTS tape left it double the current, completely undamaged. The magnets we develop in the HTS team uh, will, will give us a viable route to producing the magnetic fields necessary for fusion.